Welcome everyone to today's event, Technology That Matters, Wrapping Food in a Silky Edible Coating to Prevent Food Waste, presented by SG Innovate and SMART, Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. I am Zing from SG Innovate, and if you're new to us, we are a government-owned organization in Singapore with the mission to build deep tech innovations from Singapore for the world. We invest in and help build deep tech startups in the fields of artificial intelligence, med tech, and quantum tech, just to name a few. We work with entrepreneurial scientists and clinicians to help bring their innovative research from lab to market, and we also develop tech talent and engage with a vibrant deep tech ecosystem. Today, as part of the Technology That Matters series, we are glad to have Professor Benedito Marelli here to share more about his research into recent developments in the nanomanufacturing of silk proteins to prolong shelf life of perishable food. With Singapore's food waste accounting for up to 10% of total waste generated, we are always keen to see how it is we can reduce this figure for a sustainable future. Just some house rules. During the webinar, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And do feel free to use the chat box function to connect with our wider community. Before we begin, let me hand over the time to Krishna Kumar, Associate Director of SMART and the moderator of today's sessions to say a few words. Krish, please. Uh, thank you, Zee. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. And welcome to this talk. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we start, uh, let me do a brief introduction to SMART and the SMART Innovation Center. SMART is MIT's research, MIT's research enterprise in Singapore. Uh, we conduct research uh, uh, which is interdisciplinary across a very diverse areas, ranging from new to the world integrated circuits to urban agriculture to personalized medicine. Uh, SMART uh, works uh, in a connected manner with the various research institutions in and the universities in the Singapore ecosystem. The Innovation Center of which I'm a part uh, helps provide funding and support towards commercialization of technologies across this, this Singapore ecosystem. And over the last 10 years, uh, we have trained over 1,000 postdocs and have helped create 47 startups. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Marelli for joining us uh, and sharing uh, uh, sharing this talk with us, and uh, let me introduce him properly to you. Uh, professor Benedetto Marelli is the Paul M. Cook Career Development Assistant Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. He received a Bachelor's in Engineering and a Master of Science in Biomedical Engineering from Politicinco di Milano in 2005 and 2008, and a PhD in Material Science from McGill University in 2012. After a postdoc stint at the Silk Lab at Tufts University, Prof. Marelli joined MIT as a faculty member in November of 2015. Uh, he heads the Marelli Research Group, which works in the areas of structural biopolymers and nanomanufacturing. Uh, Prof. Marelli has received several awards, including PKs, NSF Career, ONR Young Investigator, and ONR Director of Research Early Career Award. Uh, his research has been awarded more than 15 patents, and he is a co-founder of Mori Inc., which uses silk technologies to enhance the pres preservation of perishable food, which is going to be the central theme of his talk today. And without much ado, uh, let me welcome Professor Merrily to take over. Professor Merrily. Thank you very much for your very nice introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone. Let me start my presentation so we can dive uh, directly into the talk. So you should be able to see the presentation now. And thank you very much for your introduction. I'm very uh, glad to have this opportunity. And I uh, I, look, I look forward uh, then uh, interacting with you during the Q&A. Uh, so my, my lab, it, my expertise is really material science. So as, as we just learned, I'm, I'm a material scientist and then biomedical engineer. And really what my lab does try to answer this question, how do we, sustainably feed the 9.7 billion world? Of course, this is a gigantic question to answer, to answer only having eight people working, but uh, we do believe that you, we, what we could do, we could try to have, to find very small solution that then can have a big impact. And, and of course, um, 
um, being invited to this talk allowed me to showcase the kind of solutions that we're targeting and, and what um, what kind of work we're doing. And so why do we need to feed 9.7 billion people? Why do we think it's so important? Well, the answer is there is a big need to make the food and agriculture infrastructure more resilient. We're gonna add 2 billion people by 2050. We already have that 800 million people suffer from food insecurity, which really means uh, hunger. And, and so if you look, for example, and this is globally, and then of course, if you look down to the region where Singapore is, we actually found out that Singapore is doing an amazing job in terms of food security because it ranks first uh, when it comes to the, um, to the global food security ranking. Uh, but of course, the rest of the world has, uh, has their problems. And so we need to think globally and we need to think how to, how to tackle the problem uh, look, uh, globally. The other uh, issue that we have is that what the pandemic taught us among several other lessons is that there's really a need to make the food infrastructure more uh, resilient to face problems like the pandemic. So there, uh, the food supply chain has gone in crisis in several places. And so we need to find new solution to, uh, to be able to efficiently and sustainable, sustainably uh, make food. Another problem that we have is that not only we need to um, to make food and we need to be able to consume food, but we also need to be sure that we're not wasting the food. Uh, food waste is a very, very big crisis. In my opinion, is one of the biggest crises we're facing and we need to take care of. And in fact, if we look at the, at the numbers, 30% uh, of the food we're producing globally, 30 to 40 is, is wasted. This is a gigantic number. Consider that we have 800 million people that suffer from hunger, but we're wasting enough food that can feed 1.6 billion people. So we already have a surplus in, in uh, food production, but we're wasting it. And we're using a lot of resources to make food that is never eaten. If we look at the consumption, we're consuming 25% of the global fresh water to make food that is never eaten and we're producing a lot of greenhouse gases making food that is never eaten to the point that uh, food waste is the third the third producer of greenhouse gases in the world after us and china so these are really big problems if we go back uh, to singapore as i said singapore does an amazing job when it comes to food security but there is a but and the but is that singapore imports the fuel that uh, Singaporeans are eating. Like 90% of the food eaten in Singapore comes from abroad. Um, that's a very big number. And so the resiliency of the food infrastructure for Singapore needs to increase um, according to, uh, to the parameters that are used internationally. And so of course the government is very active uh, in this and started the 30 by 30 program uh, for which basically plans to sustainably produce 30% of the nutritional need of Singaporean by uh, 2030. The other um, interesting fact that we need to address in Singapore is that we have an increase in the production uh, of the greenhouse gas uh, from food consumption. And this is just because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a city and typically in the urban setting, settings, the amount of um, the amount of energy that is required to produce and consume food from the farm to fork increases due to the fact that they said that uh, we're in a urban setting. And so, but there are methods that can be developed to, um, to mitigate this. And I just want to point out that the Singapore Food Agency now is advertising that there is food that is locally grown and, and of course is encouraging everyone to, to consume that type of food. Um, so why, so how basically what Singapore can do in order to meet the 30 by 30 uh, goal? Well, in my opinion, of course, there are several ways and politicians know how to do that much better than uh, academics. But in my opinion, there are two very important points that we need to consider. The first one is, of course, we need to produce locally and producing locally meaning uh, starting production in Singapore. And so this is why Singapore is investing so heavily in uh, urban farming and vertical farming. And because it makes sense also from an energetic perspective to produce locally. If we linearize the supply chain of food, as you can see here, uh, the supply chain requires a lot of input and it also has outputs. And both these inputs and outputs are very energy intensive and they're producing waste that typically needs to be 
uh, either recycle or we need to take care of. Uh, and if we look at the supply chain, we do have a lot of processing, packaging, storing, and transport. And of course, if we can minimize transport, we're decreasing cost and we're decreasing uh, environmental impact. Something that is very important though, is also the packaging and the storing because we want to minimize uh, the food loss, but in reality, the food loss can also happen here at the pre-harvest level. So we want to be sure we're having very robust method to maximize crop production or the production of food while also maintaining the food uh, until the point is eaten uh, at the consumer level. And so there are several ways in which we can decide what target uh, we have in terms of local production. One way for sure to look at the production of a greenhouse gas uh, per kilogram of food as a function of the retail, of the retail place. Um, we can also think about convenient, uh, so which food would be convenient to be grown in a, in a urban farming settings. And we can also look at the annual total consumption of food in terms of retail price. And so, and we can always look also at the at food habits. And so each part of the world has different food habits. And so also the food production needs to, to meet this type of food habits. And a, a very interesting example is really the leafy vegetables because they have a very low impact uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emission, but they do maintain a very good uh, retail price and they're under consumed in the case of Singapore. So we can think about pushing, producing leaf vegetable uh, locally and pushing their consume uh, to, the, to the population so that we can, of course, expand also in their nutritional value, which is, uh, is very high. And so in order to do that as, as smart, uh, which is, as, as we learned the Singapore MIT research, um, that we have uh, in, uh, in, in Singapore and, and is the MIT uh, research enterprise in Singapore uh, has funded and through uh, the National Resource Foundation has funded this stuff, which is the disruptive and sustainable technology for agricultural precision. So it's an interdisciplinary research group that is led by Michael Strano and Nam Hai Chua, uh, where we're developing new technologies for urban farming. And in particularly we are uh, targeting uh, advanced analytics were targeting a feedback control on the production of the of the leafy greens typically. And so we're producing new technologies, uh, for example, portable Raman sensor, portable uh, nano sensor for optical systems. And we're working in close contact with our collaborators at NUS, NTU, and the Temasek Life Science Laboratory in order to build a new technology that can be deployable in Singapore, but of course can also uh, reach out to the world. And, and, and so this is very exciting. And this probably answered to the first way of how we can meet the 30 by 30 um, goal, which is to increase the local food production. The focus of my talk though is on the second part, which is how we can minimize uh, the waste. And I, I said before that the 30% of the food is wasted globally, but also Singapore has a, has a problem with, uh, with food uh, waste. The problem meaning it could enhance uh, or it could reduce, sorry, uh, the generation of food waste and, and their food loss. Um, and this is because Singapore typically uh, wastes around uh, 750 million kilogram of food every year, which almost counts for two bowl of rice uh, per person. And as you can think about, that's a lot of food, which also generates a lot of, of waste streams. Okay, so it's also difficult to uh, to get rid of this waste. Uh, it can also become an opportunity really because food waste can be upcycled uh, towards, for example, making fertilizers, making advanced materials. And there are several companies in Singapore uh, or even energy, and there are several companies in Singapore that are targeting this. So really we need to think of a problem, particularly for food as an opportunity to upcycle and to, uh, and, and to make our world more sustainable, uh, trying to minimize the environmental impact. And, and so how my lab does that is, is in a way that can, can look a little bit uh, weird, <laughs> if you like, because our starting point is this, uh, this entity that you have in the middle of your screen, and many of you may recognize this being a silk cocoon. So the silk cocoon is where it all starts in my lab. We are growing caterpillars. I, I even have caterpillars here in my house. I cannot show you, but uh, we're growing them. We're, we're, we're having the cocoons. Sometimes we are buying the cocoons from a uh, different part of the world uh, because it's easier. And, and then we take the cocoons and we reverse engineer silk. Okay, so think about the silk in the state 
that it has in the gland of the caterpillar of the spider. When the seed we're talking about is the seed that comes from the silkworm, uh, so from the bombyx morris, so it's the same seed that you use for textile application, but don't think as at the fibril, okay? Don't think we're using fibrils. Fiber, fibers of silk are a, a way in which the caterpillar spins the silk to make a fiber. In reality, silk behave as a bioplastic and can be solubilized in water. So this is the beauty is that is a water insoluble material that can be solubilized in water. And this is the magic and it's called the silk polymorphism. And it all depends on the molecular structure of seeds that can be uh, stabilized in a random coil format. So whenever we have a random coil silk, we have a water soluble silk, or it can be in a beta sheet format. And whenever we have a beta sheet silk, we have a water insoluble uh, silk. And so this process of reverse engineer the silk cocoon was not discovered uh, by Malamba. It was discovered in the 60s, so I was not even born. Uh, and now, since the, in the last 20 years, we really learned how to capitalize on this discovery by engineering the self-assembly or to direct the assembly process of the molecules that are in our silk solution. Something else that I will also want to point out is that think of silk as a byproduct of a leaf. The caterpillar eats the, the mulberry leaves and transform them in this textile fiber. And eventually our goal is to transform this fiber in a very high technical or in an advanced materials that can target food uh, and agriculture in this case. So how is the process of self-assembly uh, happen? So this is a a TM, it's called a cryo TM, so it's an electron microscopy in ice of a silk solution. And what we can see here are silk nanomycel. We can call them nanomycels, nanoparticles, depending on what we believe is the structure of the silk, but really they are nanoparticles. And, and so this is the solution state of silk. If we can then drive the self assembly by simply um, putting some energy into the system or allowing the system at rest because eventually thermodynamically the material wants to aggregate. And what we make, we'll make nanofibrillar networks where the nano vesicle or the nanoparticles coalesce to make this uh, randomly organized nanofibrils. And what you see here are empty spaces. This is called the salt gel transition. If we then let the water evaporate, this becomes a gel to solid transition and the hydrogen bonds between the protein and the water are uh, replaced with intra and intermolecular hydrogen bonds to make a material that can be amorphous. So this would be a mostly random coil material that is water soluble or a crystalline beta sheet. These are the beta sheet plane that is in a water insoluble material. And this is called the, again, the polymorphism uh, of silk. And as you can see, the final product is a monolithic material. It's a bulk material. It's not a fiber. We don't have nanofibrils here, okay? Uh, we could eventually thinking about re-engineering silk in a nanofibrillar or in a fibrillar format, but by simply self-assembly, we do have the formation of a monolithic uh, polymer. Um, we also define a new way to direct, in this case, the assembly that is called the templated assembly uh, of silk. And in this case, we used um, a peptide, a highly repetitive and highly structured peptide, which can be um, of this of a similar amino acidic amino acidic sequence of silk for the one of you who knows uh, biochemistry these letters stand for amino acids uh, and so this is the typical sequence of the crystalline part of silk and our peptides can be made by a similar structure a similar primary structure also a different primary structure but what it matters is that the moment we introduce these peptides in our silk solution we have what is called a disorder to order transition of silk so the silk starts to assemble around our nano whiskers to make a nanofibrillar structure. This is done at low concentration, so we could image, Im, uh, we could take image with a with a TM, but we could also do it high concentration, and so the material would be much more packed than what it looks like here. And this growth process of silk can be really very beautifully uh, modeled with an Avrami equation, so with an equation that describes uh, the growth of a material uh, or, a sig or a typical sigmoidal equation, which where you have a, a lag phase, a growth phase, and a plateau phase. And the Avrami equation is nice because it provides us with parameters that we can tune in order to modulate the final properties of our material. And so once we know how to assemble and how to template the assembly of silk, our fiber can be engineered into all of these 
different material formats. These are all made by silk. We can have screws, so we can machine down the, the silk monolith, the silk blocks to make a screw. We can make new fibers, we can make particles of different dimensions from the micro to the nanosphere. We can make gels that can be transparent, hollow structure. And then we can start to use advanced fabrication technique like soft lithography, electron beam lithography, uh, printing to really uh, also merge top down and bottom up fabrication technique. And so for example, we can 3D print silk, we can make aerogel, we can make photonic crystal and such. The idea here is really to get that the natural polymer, the one that comes from a leaf, eventually becomes a technical material which has a, a lot of application in biomedical engineering, uh, in regenerative medicine, drug delivery. It has a lot of application for as a substrate for electronics that can be biodegradable. But in our case, we can really engineer an interface with foods and plants, and we can uh, and we can modulate the self assembly to in interface this material uh, with food and plants. And so, what my lab does, this is the list of the recent output we're having. So we do food coating, and we're going to see today how we can do food coating. We can also do seed coating to deliver biofertilizers uh, to boost agricultural production in marginal lands and uh, in semi-arid regions of the world. We have now field tests in Morocco. Um, within this step, what we're doing, we're doing precise delivery of payloads uh, into plant for high-tech crop maintenance. Or we can use uh, we can use the same micro needles to extract information from food in order to, to detect um, food pathogens. So for food safety concerns. So why silk is so interesting? First of all, the, the whole process that I described for you happens at room temperature, at, uh, atmospheric pressure, neutral pH. And the whole regeneration process from this fiber to the um, to the final material happens in water. Okay. The only uh, the only chemical we need to add are cowtropic ion. Think about lithium bromide, lithium calcium, cowtropic ion that are able to substitute the hydrogen bond uh, between the fiber with intermolecular hydrogen uh, with mole with hydrogen bonds with the ion, and so basically they disaggregate the the fiber. Okay, and then eventually we need to dialyze out this ion, which is um, which is part of the processing of silk. And so the, the moment we're able to have this material, the material becomes sustainable because again, it comes from a leaf. Uh, it can be processed in water. We can control the degradation by changing the amount of a beta sheet and random coil uh, that we have in the, or, or alpha helix that we have in the final material. And it's a material that is edible, is a protein at the end of the day that is processed in water. So it's really, it's really interesting, an opportunity, the fact that it's comestible and edible for applications in plants uh, and food. And so we're really uh, looking forward in, uh, in, in developing exciting new applications. And, and the fact that it's edible, for example, we also know because we, we can consume uh, caterpillars in some region of the world that, they are delicatessen and I, I've eaten them and they actually taste very good, particularly with honey. Or in some countries you can also find, you can also buy food ingredients that are basically flour and, pow and powderized silk. Um, and so we, we leverage this knowledge uh, in order to make edible coatings for perishable food preservation. And, and we're gonna now look at how uh, you can do that. So remember, is a, is a solution. We start from the caterpillar, the caterpillar, sorry, we start with the cocoons that the caterpillar makes. Uh, the, the cocoons can be uh, regenerated in a solution, uh, which can be either maintained as a solution or it can be freeze dried in a powder that then can be re-exposed to water to make the solution. And then this solution can be sprayed uh, on, uh, on, our, um, on our crop. Let's say here we're using strawberry or, it, or we can simply dip coat. And being a solution, and it effectively, the, the interesting part is that we could change the rheological properties of the solution by tuning the regeneration process of silk. Uh, and so we can retrofit all the equipment that are currently used to apply food coatings uh, using our silk as a solution. And so this opens up uh, very interesting uh, opportunities. And so the first experiment that we made, I. I made it here in Lexington, I so uh, right outside Boston. And we, we went to a farm and, and we bought strawberries. And we bought strawberries because there was a, a food competition in the lab where we needed to use silk. And, and so I was thinking about doing a chocolate, uh, strawberry chocolate fondue where you, you know, you have fused chocolate and then you dip coat your 
uh, strawberry with chocolate than you eat it. And, but instead of using chocolate, I wanted to do uh, with silk. And so I deep coat my strawberries in this silk solution and then I let them dry. I let them dry and nothing happened. Like they look st like strawberries. Uh, it, that was expected really, uh, because we already knew that silk can make these very transparent, defect-free films. So uh, you experience silk as a, as, a, as a white fiber, but in reality silk is, is when in the forms of a film, is completely transparent. More than 95% of light can go through it. And, and so I left the, so I, I was kind of, I didn't know if I was excited or not, but I, I left the, the strawberries there. And then I came back after one, uh, one week and, and I saw that the half of the strawberries were spoiled. So they look like this. And some of them was kind, were kind of spoiled, but there was a big chunk of the strawberries that were not spoiled. And, and, and so that's where we realized uh, that was an opportunity to use this material as a food coating. And, and, and so we started to look in literature and, and we saw some example of food coatings, but we also noticed that there was an increasing interest in really minimize food waste and try to find new coatings. And so we started investigating the properties of silk uh, as a barrier. And we saw that, for example, by modulating the amount of beta sheet, so making the silk more water insoluble, you can decrease the oxygen diffusion. By increasing the amount of beta sheet, you can also decrease the fraction of weight loss from, a, from your original strawberry, which means that the water, that you have less dehydration. And we also monitor the respiration rate of the strawberry and we saw that that decreased. And so effectively we started to believe that this, was, this would be a very interesting solution for uh, food coating. And, and so after targeting a non-climacteric uh, fruit as strawberry, we also started targeting climacteric fruit with the peel Okay, so the peel is, is, is very thick, the one of bananas. And we said, can this micrometer thick coating, so the silk coating we apply is really below 10 micron, uh, have an impact on the spoil, um, on, on the spoilage of, of bananas. And so we applied the coating also on bananas. And as you can see, we were really able to extend the shelf life also uh, of bananas. And so we started to believe that this was becoming even more interesting. And so we, uh, we kept exploring and we kept investigating. And eventually we figured out that silk does three things uh, as a good uh, edible coating. And in reality, these are the three properties that each edible coating should have. It's a very good barrier for gas exchange. So typically it keeps the oxygen out is a very good barrier for water as well. And this is very unusual because generally polymers are either good barrier for oxygen or for water. Silk somehow is able to manage to, to do both. And, and so it keeps the water in and is also a very good barrier for microbes. And so these are the three qualities that silk has. And so if you take a, a lemon and, and you let it, and you leave it on the bench after uh, seven days, basically, uh, or 10 days looks like this, but if you coat it with silk, of course it maintains its properties. And so we were even more excited and we kept our excitement. And eventually we figure out that what makes silk as a special as a food coating is really that is a, is a universal coating. We believe it can apply on many, many crops and food. It doesn't work perfectly for every crops and food I have to say, but uh, there's a lot of room for improvement because the molecular structure can be changed and can be adapted depending on the food. And so each food has needs a barrier as an edible barrier that has different properties. And with silk, we can adapt this by changing the polymorphic structure. So by changing uh, how the molecule folds in the dry state. And, and so we, we started to, to look also in the microbial uh, barrier and we figure out that silk in the cocoon has a has a very good is a very good microbial barrier because by selective pressure so by uh, by nature the caterpillar has made a silk that can protect itself from microbial contamination during um, inside the cocoon and so this is because silk lacks the amino acid sequences that are necessary for microbial addition and so eventually we we pushed this forward and we were able to self designate silk as as a grass material in the United States. So a material that is generally recognized as safe and, and can be used as, as a food ingredient. Uh, we, in the labs part, we are also now looking at other polymers that can be co, um, that can be mixed with silk in order to try to further tune the barrier properties. And as you can see, in this case, we use polyvinyl alcohol, which is a, 
is a synthetic polymer, but is uh, is is grass. So it has the grass status. So it's generally recognized as safe. It's very used in the food industry and in, and in the pharmaceutical industry. And by changing the different weight ratio between silk SF stands for silk and uh, polyvinyl alcohol, you can actually change the microstructure of the coating. And this is because polyvinyl alcohol and silk are uh, immiscible. And, and so you can have different microstructure and this different microstructure can be used to further control the, the barrier properties of our material. And, and so we try this on a fresh cut fruit and, and we figure out that, for example, with apples, we can really extend the shelf life of fresh cut uh, apple, in this case, in the fridge. And the reason for that is because we're decreasing the browning uh, and we're also decreasing a lot the water permeability. So as you can see, particularly if you're using a 50-50% of the two material, uh, we're really able to decrease the water permeability. We don't have a big impact on oxygen permeability though. Um, and so the, we founded the company uh, to further expand these efforts. Of course, I couldn't do it in, in the lab. And so we, uh, we really found, uh, we were really excited to found a company which only works with silk fibrin. Uh, and the company was called originally Cambridge Crops, uh, which is the name I gave. Now, uh, of course, the company is growing and they need to reach out to new markets. And so we chose as a new name, Mori, because of the Bombix Mori is the name uh, of the caterpillar. And what the company now is doing is developing a product. They, are, they raised uh, 17.3 million dollars in the series uh, between the seed funds and the series a uh, they're targeting the product in the next nine to 18 months and so we're looking at uh, production we're looking at how scale scaling up the process and we already have uh, pilot studies and the interesting part is that there is a there are tons and tons and tons of seed that are produce every year. And we can use all the seed that is not good for textile applications. So we can really use the waste and the low grade inputs. Think about seed, you generally think about very expensive material because the cocoon that are grade of the highest uh, value, they are sold to the textile companies, but there are so many cocoons that are waste because they're not good enough for the textile companies. And so we can use them and we can repurpose them in an advanced materials instead of going wasted. The yield is very high. We have 75 to 80% yield from the fiber to the final product. And so this also, of course, will allow us hopefully to generate um, high ROIs for customers and, and high margins. And of course, now what we also need to figure out is the logistics, how we're moving silk from the part of the world that produce silk to our different uh, production facilities that we will have, how we uh, scale up production and what targets we're gonna have at the end of our, um, basically what's the first product that is gonna be out. The interesting part is that we can really retrofit existing technology. So in this case, for example, we, this is a pilot study that we have in a field where we, there's a harvester that is harvesting kale and the seal can be applied right at the point of harvest, okay? So this really guarantees the highest um, shelf life of the product. Uh, and so for example, this is scale uh, where we can enhance the stability for up to 25 days uh, compared to the uncoated uh, product. And again, we can really integrate our system in the existing equipment, uh, which is, is really a big plus because this is something that really everybody uh, is, is asking us uh, to do. We don't only target crops and and um, and fruit. We can also target meat, both fish and 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 meat. And so, in this case, for example, this is a, a fillet uh, of fish, and this is the difference between the coated and non-coated. And really, the difference though is in the smell. So, the fish that I cannot let you smell the fish of water in the presentation, but the difference that the, this this fish that is coated it, it, it loses the bad smell that fish has when it goes, when it's spoiled. Uh, and not because we're <laughs> we're not allowing the, the smell to come out from the coating, but because we're preventing microbial contamination of our food. And and of course, if you if you then uh, make a, a, a consumer try to choose which food, uh, which fish they would uh, they would choose, uh, Mori is the one that had the majority of the of the choice. So we, we believe that this could really also have an impact in this uh, sector. So this is just to give you a very brief overview on the different crops and meats that we're targeting and 
how modular and how universal our coating we believe it is. Because for example, in the case of kale, it slows the respiration rate and you reduce yellowing, wilting and rot. In the case of cut vegetables, this is cut zucchini. Again, this is only silk. We maintain color and texture and we reduce microbial growth. In the case of cherries, we are reducing pitting and dehydration and we maintain the stem greenness. And again, this is all achieved by changing the quality and the properties of the silk uh, by understanding what type of polymorphic structure would work best for that specific product. Uh, in beef, we're slowing the gas exchange and we're maintaining color, so we're reducing oxidation. In the case of fish, we're not only maintaining color, but as I told you, we're also improving the smell light, which is very important. And we're also targeting candies, both um, both soft and hard candies. Uh, and what it does, they protect damage from water and oxygen and they improve the sensor experience because of course they maintain uh, water, they maintain the color, the texture and, and everything. And so we really believe that uh, this small solution that came from a lab where I was really cooking, try to cook with silk might have a, a big impact because it would reduce our waste. Uh, but also allows us to make packaging more sustainable because the same material eventually can also be used to make packaging. This is, I don't present this now because I believe we really need to be able to scale up production in order to go from an edible coating to an edible packaging, but we can also foresee the application of silk in, in packaging. And we're gonna ease the logistics of the supply chain and hopefully we can, we're also able to uh, make food that can be shipped further. Of course, we, we want to have local production, but somehow sometimes local production is not possible. And for some markets, it's very important to open, uh, for some producers, it's very important to open new markets far away. And to do that, we need to use ship as a, as a way of moving the, the food. And of course, if we can enhance the preservation, that can open uh, new markets. And so the idea is really to give access to fresh food to everyone so that everyone can eat better. Because remember, the food is the most important determinant of human health in the world. Uh, and so the company itself now, I, I don't want to waste too much. No, I don't want to use too much time of your attention on the company. Uh, but uh, we do now it has its own life. So I, I don't know everything that they're doing. Um, and so this is just uh, this is actually a slide that the CEO gave me so that uh, people can see wh where the company is going and how well protected it is. I don't want to comment too much on it because it's, uh, this is really coming from the company. So I, I believe is, um, is is really important just to show that uh, there, there's a lot of potential in our technology and, and we do believe we can have a big impact in, in, in the future. And for me, the most important message I, I hope I gave you in my talk is really that this structural polymer, so silk is called a structural biopolymer, a structural natural fiber, can really have a big impact as a future material that can be used for many application in combination or in substitution of oil-derived polymer. But particularly, there's an interesting opportunity to use them at the interface uh, with food and plants, because these are the building blocks of life, and we're using the building block of life to control the metabolism, to control the uh, of foods and plants. And, and so this will allow us to mitigate the environmental impact and to and to build a better, more sustainable society. And so at, at the end, I just wanna thank everybody uh, that collaborates in my group. And um, so my graduate students, my postdocs, the Poland Cook Professorship, who's uh, sponsor of course my stipend, and then all the sponsors that I have for the nanotechnology part, which is really how you, engineer silk, which I didn't have the opportunity to give you too much uh, of a glimpse. Uh, I, I didn't have the opportunity to go too much in detail, but I hope I gave you a glimpse. And, and of course, all the sponsors for precision agriculture where this stuff and, and smart is, uh, uh, is really the most prominent one. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now ready to answer any question you might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Merrily, for that very interesting talk. Uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, really to understand that food waste actually is the third largest uh, uh, producer of greenhouse gases was really a revelation for me. And uh, we can see how uh, uh, fresh food is wasted across the entire value chain that you described, right from the time of harvest to warehousing, storage, distribution, retail, and then at home, right? All of us see yeah. it happening uh, uh, on our shelves at home. 
So, so uh, uh, our ability to be active contributors to actually uh, prolonging the use of food, enhancing food security, and also reducing greenhouse gases is, is very interesting. Uh, uh, I also must say that I'm really astonished by uh, our ability to actually use a, a natural, naturally occurring uh, uh, product and, uh, to, to, to the benefit of enhancing uh, uh, food. So uh, I can see that there's a lot of interesting questions that, that are being asked. What I'd like to do uh, is that uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, trying to bring questions that are related to the technology up front first. Uh, then we'll go into questions that are uh, related to adjacent technologies around uh, uh, where, where, where this technology can be used. And then we can go into other interesting considerations that uh, people have asked about. So, uh, uh, so the first uh, very interesting question that uh, somebody has asked is about, you know, will this protein cause allergic reactions if it comes in, uh, when people consume it? Because you're talking of an edible coating. So that's a very good question. And that's, of course, where the, the company needs to make their own uh, homeworks. Uh, so silk has been widely used for, as, a, as a biomedical material, typically the application that is mostly uh, everybody think about are the suture thread. And there have been cases where the suture thread have caused allergic reactions, but that's mostly because there is another protein in the in the silk that is called uh, sericin uh, that needs to be removed. And so if that protein is not correctly removed, it can cause to some people an allergic reaction. Uh, that I'm aware of, there's not, that never has been an allergic reaction to fibrin, but I, I, I might be wrong, but for sure, uh, that's part of what the the company will need to figure out. We know that in the um, for the FDA, so in the case of the United States, we were able to obtain the self designated grass status. So we we know we can use it, but uh, we're gonna be very keen in 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 controlling that. Uh, also, the other point is that the the amount of seed that goes into the coating is very little. Uh, so hopefully, if there's ever an allergic reaction, it would not be bad, but. For sure, that there, we will need more studies on that. Uh, interesting, because somebody has asked whether there's an in vivo uh, testing that has been done for, uh, for for the coating. But I guess uh, what you're there saying are, is that that's are. a part of the. Yeah. Okay. There are. So uh, the uh, other question, which is very related, is that does it affect the taste and texture of food? Uh, you know, uh, because you're inhibiting the natural ripening, perhaps, of these foods, right? So uh, if so you that's coat it very early. Question then what happens? So that depends. So let's say if I, th I think the question targets mostly uh, crops and, and fruit. Um, so if it's non-climacteric, so if it's a fruit like strawberry, the moment you pick is not going to continue ripening. Okay. And, and so that's not really where uh, there would be a concern. But in other in other fruit like apples, bananas uh, that are using ethylene for the ripening process, uh, th that's a, a big concern. And uh, what I can tell you is that we still need to complete the studies on the permeation of ethylene, but we do know that the, that the, the crop continue the ripening process. So it's not that we stop it. Uh, so we don't believe that we're really gonna alter that. The other uh, branch, how the other, how the question can also branch out is, is the coating itself changing the texture uh, make, I don't know, make, make a strawberry more crunchy. And uh, the answer is no, uh, because it's a very thin coating. It's really, it's below 10 microns, so you can barely uh, sense it uh, with your tongue. And silk per se is a protein that is almost tasteless. And, and it doesn't change also the appearance because it doesn't give a who is very transparent. So it has really very good quality for a coating, I have to say. And, and, and that was all by chance. Like we didn't know about that. We, we discovered it after. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Chance discovery leading to something which is very very unique. I uh, just wanted to check with you. Does it also help reduce refrigeration of the food because of the coating? Yes. So will it reduce the cost of uh, the supply chain? We, we believe so. We believe so. Uh -huh. For example, the strawberries. They were the extension of the shelf life is outside the fridge, so you do have okay. one week outside the fridge. Uh, the fresh cut zucchini that I show you, that's in the fridge. 
uh, and the, I believe the kale is in the fridge as well. The 25 days is in the fridge, but you, you, you can also increase outside the fridge, the stability. And uh, uh, how do you plan to uh, see this in use? Do you, which, you know, at what stage do you think it, is it ideal to do the coating uh, in the supply chain? Is it at the time that you harvest or is it, you know, later on when you are putting it on a retail shelf? So I think there are uh, two ways to answer. There is the commercially more valuable uh, answer, and I don't have an answer for that, but from a scientific perspective, as soon as you harvest, even pre-harvest really, we can also apply the coating pre-harvest. And, and so the, the, the sooner the better, uh, because then the food becomes, you, people start to manipulate the food, the ripening process starts, the dehydration starts, uh, oxygen stress starts, and so, as soon as you harvest, you apply the coating that generally would be the best um, way of doing it to prolong the shelf life. But there are cases where shelf life needs to be prolonged downstream in the supply chain just to create more value. And, and so we can also think in applying uh, in that case. So uh, here's another question, uh, which is uh, slightly related to the same. Uh, Today, with this en entire scenario of COVID and the pandemic, you know, people do when they get produce from outside, they wash it, they they clean it, and then they keep, uh, uh, then they store uh, store the store the food. So, uh, if you were to wash a coated uh, food, then would you need to recoat it to ensure that uh, 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 that the food stays fresh, or uh, you know, because the coating gets washed away, or how does it work? So we can have two coatings. We can have a coating that can be washed away uh, because we have we can have a seed that is water soluble or a seed that is water insoluble. Uh, so the coating that can wash can be washed away would be less ef effective as a coating. Generally speaking, it's not always the case, but generally speaking, is less effective. And and we have a coating that it cannot be washed away, and so in that case, it would survive the washing in the house uh, before you're consuming it. Um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, so it's stable. Uh, another related question, which is a little bit on the ethical side. Uh, any ethical concerns uh, on stress to the silkworms for the production of, you know, silk on large there scale? There are. There are. We have that uh, very clearly in mind. So uh, there are two answers to this. So I think there are several ethical concerns. The first one is an animal protein. And so many people, due to their personal belief or religious belief, they will need to be sure uh, for example, they might not be okay with eating an animal protein or uh, the, we, we were working, for example, to have the HALAR certification, the kosher certification for our products. And, and so that's one, uh, one reason. Uh, there, is a, there are people who are afraid that the Bombix Morris or the caterpillar suffer um, because in, in, the most, in the sericulture, typically they are killed um, to be produced. We can have cocoons where the caterpillar can exit and become a moth. Uh, so the caterpillar can go through the life cycle and become a moth because we don't need a single thread of silk, okay, right. as the textile companies. And there are also ways that have been developed in India where the caterpillar can be taken out from the cocoon without uh, killing it after, uh, after basically it finished making the cocoon. Uh, and so we're working actively with all these um, reality to to develop the best way to source our silk uh, so to address these ethical concerns the other way would be to produce silk using uh, synthetic biology right. and there are right. companies that are doing that they don't have the yield the same yield that we can have though and um, so i think we need to work more on the synthetic biology side to be able to have the volumes that are required for agriculture and food uh, but that's the future for sure uh, and uh, one more question related to uh, uh, the topic of uh, uh, coatings, uh, and then we'll move on to some things which are associated. Uh, what do you think is the, would be the additional cost of you know deploying these kind of solutions in the market? Uh, will it make it more expensive, uh, and would it be so, affordable for the for the public? So it, that's a good question. So we do believe it's going to be affordable for the public. Uh, if it makes it more expensive, it depends because if you apply the coating, you're also reducing the water loss and you're reducing the. So you're waste, if you're wasting so much food, if you can 
uh, if you can, even if you add a price to the food, but the food is maintained longer, it doesn't go as waste. You're not losing money, right? So I can go to the supermarket that I can buy food, but if the food, if I'm, if I'm wasting 20% of the food, it doesn't matter if it costs a little bit more, I'm still losing money there. Uh, I believe we're gonna add few fraction of a cent, for example, to an apple uh, or few cents maximum to a, that, that's the typical question everybody asks, how many cents you, you, ask, you add to an apple? And so we're in the targets probably of few fractions of a cent. So I, I guess, uh, uh, I mean, another way to look at it from what you're, uh, uh, what you're sharing is that uh, the overall cost, as far as the industry is concerned, uh, there is a higher recovery from the food that is sold because there is less wastage. So uh, in reality, uh, you're trying to recover uh, from one unit, one kilogram of, uh, 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 of apples, for instance, you may be trying to recover 1.3 kilograms of uh, cost because, you know, 30 percent goes to waste. But by applying this, you're more likely to re recover the entire one kilogram cost from one kilogram of food. Therefore, it kind of averages out is what you're saying. I, I think that's the idea. Yeah, so, so that's very interesting. So uh, moving on to some things which are, uh, you know, uh, in related fields, uh, uh, the questions are more in terms of why uh, you stumbled on onto coatings. Uh, if, if not this, what would you, what was your initial trajectory for, for, the, for the research? <laughs> I was doing, uh, I was using silk and other structural proteins like collagen, keratin, um, to make biodegradable optoelectronics uh, that can be either implanted in the body or can be left in the environment. So yeah. sensors and yeah, and and then I stumble on the coating, and that's where my interest in food and agriculture started, and my career went sideways, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, uh, that's one of the questions that uh, has got a lot of interest, which is that how you looked at the optical properties of characterization of these silk fibers. And yeah, they are very well characterized. So my, where I did my postdoc is in the Professor Manetto's lab at Tufts, where they really exploited the, the, the optical and photonic use of silk. Um, and and uh, uh, this the stumbling into this area was by chance, and now you're you're deep into this. So, do you see yourself actually moving back and exploring the other areas of uh, uh, use of silk? Because uh, uh, I I eventually will. I'm in a civil environmental engineering department, and MIT gave me this uh, incredible opportunity to work in agriculture using silk uh, when they hired me, and so I really want to exploit it as much as I can, and. But, but of course, eventually I will go back also to other applications that are more germane to my background. But I really, I, I really wanna, uh, exp I really wanna uh, leverage this this new part of research because I think there's a very there's a very big opportunity to innovate using materials in food and agriculture, mm -hmm. and, and so I believe my lab is at the forefront of it, and so we're very happy to to contribute. In fact, uh, uh, another question that is related to other uses that people have found or, for self, which is primarily in medical applications, is that can it be used, uh, you know, uh, in devices to fight biofilms because it is an antimicrobial, right? Uh, in terms of allowing the development of. So that's a of, very good. Uh, go ahead. That's a very good point. I believe it could, and I would be surprised if nobody thought about that before. Also, because something I didn't introduce is that. One of the beauty of silk is that it can also preserve molecules that are encapsulated at the point of assembly. So in the case of the food, we can think about encapsulate nutrients. So let's say you're adding vitamins to your food by encapsulating them. And it also works very well with antimicrobial agents, uh, like anti uh, antibiotics typically. And so it, it, it would be possible. It would be possible, well, that's, that's... but I, I don't know if in a, in if within the body can give some anti-fouling properties. I because that also depend in the body is a different system because it depends on what protein it absorbs. Um, right. So, and it's a protein, so it's going to interact with other proteins. So it's it's a different environment compared to the outside of of, of a food. Understand. Uh, the other thing related to food is that you have a lot of uh, food wastage, which is cooked food. And uh, typically in Singapore, there is, uh, uh, there is a, a, a law which says that if you are serving food, I think cooked food cannot be served after two or three 
three three hours after uh, it is cooked. So uh, uh, because mm -hmm. it may cause you know uh, uh, infections. So can you spray uh, uh, this on top of cooked food and will it still serve the purpose of extending the life of that food? Because it may be hot. So th that's a very good idea. So the heat is not going to be a problem uh, because the protein is stable up to 200 Celsius. Uh, that's the advantage of using um, what is called an exoprotein. So a protein like your keratin in your hair, a protein that has been engineered to work outside the environment. So these are very stable proteins. Uh, I never I never applied it on a, on a cooked food. I, I don't know if the company did, but it's a very good idea. <laughs> so uh, I think okay. it's a very good idea. Okay. Uh, so uh, another question, which is uh, uh, a lot of interest is that, uh, you know, there is another company appeal in the US which has got similar technology so uh, people would like to understand you know how is this different from appeal so there are several companies now that are growing uh, many of them are really at the startup uh, so if you like one step before us and that are coming out with new technologies and uh, and there are technologies that are more or less at the same level and then there is appeal which is this very successful company that is really paving the way for everybody else and uh, appeal came out from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and uh, now in the United States, you can buy products that are coated with the appeal technologies, particularly avocado, and they're very successful. Um, I don't have a direct comparison of the two technologies. I believe they they can be complementary uh, because there's always the case. So uh, the appeal technology is based on a, on a different, it comes mostly from food waste. Uh, or from edible parts of food that are repurposed to uh, to make a coating, and and it's not a protein based coating, uh, but is a is a biopolymer that is not a protein, and so the barrier properties are going to be a little bit different, and so there's an opportunity that the appeal technology works better for a product, and our technologies work better for another product, or simply they can compete, and we're going to see who's uh, who works the best. But uh, appeal had. I have to say, they really. When I developed this the food coating, I didn't know about appeal. But then, as we think thought about starting incorporating, we uh, we saw how quickly appeal was emerging and how successful they were, and they really they, they paved the way, uh, if you like, to our much smaller success at the moment. But um, so it's it's incredible what they did. Sure. In fact, uh, something which is uh, slightly off center, which is that uh, another use case. Uh, have you explored the possibility of using this coating to uh, reducing the use of pesticides and insecticides? Uh, will it help, or do you think it's uh, still very far away from in terms of the research? Uh, no, no, it, it helps, <laughs> but we need to um, we need to scale up. Uh, we need to scale up production. So you're uh, saying uh, saying that because uh, uh, a part of the uh, uh, capability is about the ability to you know, uh, uh, stop the permeation of oxygen, the creation of... Uh, uh, so On some that... crops, it helps. On some crops, it helps to, um, to interfere a bit on the metabolism of the plants, but also to reduce uh, the pests uh, that could affect the plants. So, so you're now closing into the last two minutes of uh, the talk and uh, uh, one of the other questions that uh, uh, was of interest for a lot of people is uh, the topic that you brought about of sustainable packaging. Uh, and I did uh, realize that uh, in one of the examples that you showcased in terms of how silk could be used, as, it could be used for printing a 3D product. So, uh, and you talked about edible packaging. So uh, what do you think is the timeline for doing this? And what do you think are the big challenges for you to get to that point? So I think there are two aspects. The first is that by developing successful edible coatings, regardless of silk, this can be any technology, you're reducing, you can reduce the amount of plastic packaging because the plastic packaging is this amazing barrier uh, that exactly does what the edible coating does. So it keeps the water in, the oxygen out, and is a barrier for microorganisms. And so if you could uh, add an extra layer to the food, then you can decrease the, the thickness uh, of the plastic packaging. So that would also, that would allow you to mitigate their environmental impact. Ideally, we want to have plastic packaging that are made with, with these naturally derived uh, materials. 
And it's possible, I believe it's possible. We need to work a little bit more on the properties because uh, for this plastic is fantastic. So it does really an amazing job. And, and so it's a very high technology bar that we're dealing with. It's a very well established technology. And, and so it, it will require more deep into the science and, and but also in the scale up, uh, because the way, if you think about the weight of a packaging compared to the weight of the edible uh, coating, there are almost two order of magnitude of difference. And so right. uh, there's gonna be a, a big push for scaling up. Uh, and and I cost, guess- uh, And cost. And a lot cost. of the packaging is also being used uh, for the purpose of ensuring that there is no damage to the fruit itself, right? In terms exactly, of- Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, uh, that's been a very, very interesting talk, uh, Professor Marelli, and uh, thank you very much for your time. I know it's late thank you. Uh, in Boston. Uh, thank you <laughs> stay, for staying up late and sharing with us. Uh, it's been interesting. I'm sure that everybody enjoyed it. Thank you once again from all of us. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for, for following us. Thank you, Professor Marelli and Krishna, uh, to all our attendees for staying on for the whole event. Uh, we'll be sending a post-event EDM with the recording of the session and perhaps ways to contact Professor Marelli if he's so keen. So do keep an eye out of it. Thank you very much once again and have a great night and great day ahead. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.